Good to see you guys, and it is an honor to be back here, um, and it's weird, <laughs> uh, but, but it feels like uh, coming back home, for sure, so uh, it, it's great seeing many of you and getting a little bit caught up. You know, one of the, one of the reasons we came back um, was for a very special celebration and that is my mother and father-in-law, Denny and Ann George, are celebrating their 50th anniversary. Let's give it up for them. Where are they? They're right there. And I just want to say thank you, Denny and Ann, for your love and commitment to one another and the legacy that you have passed on to my family through Jennifer. Um, and man, in our day and age, to celebrate 50 years of marriage is huge. It's huge and uh, to be celebrated. So we're having a gathering afterwards. I know their small group uh, celebrated with them earlier and uh, we're gonna continue the partay. Uh, but you know, I was thinking about churches um, and churches have a legacy like a couple can have a legacy. And uh, the way that a couple develops a legacy is by being uh, faithful loving and faithful to one another and to Jesus all of their days. And what happens is faithfulness just creates this wake of blessing. And that's the legacy. The, and, 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 and so children and grandchildren benefit from the faithfulness of their, grand, of their parents and grandparents. And that's, that's the legacy. And a lot of times we don't see it. Our faithfulness, you know, we enjoy the benefits of it right now, but oftentimes we underestimate the impact it will have in the generations to come. And that's the way churches are. Uh, churches create a legacy by being faithful to God, by loving Jesus and by loving one another. And uh, it's no secret this is a challenging season for, uh, for new community. And I just want to begin by encouraging you and, and, and those of you who are here and are faithfully committed to uh, this body, um, that's what it takes to create a, a legacy. And your faithfulness, you may not see it now, others are going to benefit from it. And in fact, many of you are here because of the faithfulness of, 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 of people that have been a part of the new community for the past 20 years, all the way back. Um, and... And I got to be a part of that, a small part of that for 14 years. Some of you are like, who's this guy? <laughs> and that's awesome. I hope there's a bunch of you that are like, who's this guy? Um, but anyway, it's just an encouragement. The, the, the legacy is still being created, right? And there's always a call for continued faithfulness to God and to one another. And, and who knows the impact that we'll have down the line. So anyway, that, and what's interesting is that God, God relates to us as individuals, but he also relates to us as churches, which is what this series is, a, excuse me, is about. Dear church, he's talking to, uh, he, he's, he's, he's talking to individuals in the church, but he's addressing the church as a whole. So yeah, God deals with us individually, but he also looks at bodies of believers and says, here's what I have to say to you. By the way, uh, Colorado's great. The biggest news in our life is uh, the new status that Jennifer and I enjoy, and that is Mimi and Papa status. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> I stood about right here, and when I announced that my daughter was getting married, I think I said, basically what this means is I'm gonna be a Papa soon. And indeed, my prophecy has been fulfilled. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, uh, all is good in Colorado. Life is good. Ministry is good. It all has its challenges, but uh, we've experienced um, the Lord's goodness for sure. So anyway, God deals with churches, and so that they, that's what these letters are for. And they were for specific churches in a specific time period. All of these seven churches uh, John had started, and he's writing to them. But it's not just John writing to them. You'll notice that their letters are in red. It's really like all of scripture is God's word, but Jesus here is speaking personally through John to each of these churches. Um, and so he's addressing them as, as a church. And I know you guys, I, I've been assigned Thyatira. That's the fourth, the fourth church. So uh, we're going to jump into that and, and identify about six different lessons. So there's more there, but we barely have time for the six 
that we're going to look at. But let's read it. Let's read the whole passage so we kind of get the flow and the feel of it, and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll dig into it. So Revelation 2, uh, beginning with verse 18, to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and to the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, To you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give that one the morning star whoever has ears let them hear what the spirit says to the churches so father we pray as we look into your word that you would speak to us i pray that you would speak through me father that your word would be enlightened that we would connect with it and that we wouldn't just be hearers of the word but that we would be doers and lord where it calls us to action may we act and so Uh, We just invite you, Holy Spirit, please be here and be our teacher. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, So first lesson is this. If you're a note taker, I think it's on the back there. Um, And that is this. And this, this is an observation we could make about every one of these letters to every one of these churches. And that is the church belongs to Jesus. And his words to us are really all that matter. So as I mentioned, it's Jesus speaking directly to these churches, and he says to the angel, uh, you guys have probably been introduced to this concept, but the angel is just the word messenger, so it's most likely not an angel, but but rather a messenger that's taking a letter uh, to the church. Um, And so through this angel, this, this, this letter would be delivered to the church in Thyatira. It's interesting that Thyatira was the smallest city but they get the longest letter out of all of these. The smallest, kind of seemingly insignificant, but yet Jesus spends a lot of time. As we just read, there's a lot here that we're going to kind of have to unpack. Um, it was the gateway to Pergamum, which you guys studied last week. Um, and really, uh, Thyatira had been destroyed and rebuilt, destroyed and rebuilt, destroyed and rebuilt over and over again because they were sort of an outpost for Pergamum. So invading armies would come and it would sort of slow them down. They were sort of like a speed bump. And so, but what had developed there was trades. It was a blue collar town, small blue collar town. And Jesus is watching that church. And Jesus is now giving some very specific instruction to this church. And Jesus is the one that is talking. And look at how he's introduced. He is, he is the son of God. This is the only time in the book of Revelation that Jesus identifies himself as the son of God. You know, in the gospels, he's often uh, identified as the son of man. That's a reference to his humanity, that he came and he became a man just like you and just like me. He faced all the temptations, yet was without sin. Then he laid down his life, became the perfect sacrifice for us. That's the son of man, but he's also the son of God. And, and the Son of God is always a reference to his, his, not his humanity, but his divinity, that this is God we're dealing with. And he came once to suffer and die as a sacrifice for sins, but he's coming again. And when he comes again, he's not coming again to suffer and die. He's coming to, in not, to, to consummate his kingdom. He's coming as King of kings and Lord of lords, and he comes in blazing fire, in judgment. And that's really how he 
introduces himself here. These are the words of who? The Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and his feet are like burnished bronze. And so this reference to Jesus, it's like, okay, this is who is speaking to you. I'm, 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 I, I'm, he has these penetrating eyes. Later in the passage, which we read in verse 23, he says, then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches hearts and minds. So Jesus, the church belongs to him. He died for the church. The Bible says he purchased the church. He's the chief shepherd. He is the head of the church. The church is his body. So the church belongs to Jesus. And now there were under shepherds in the form of pastors and elders and so forth. But Jesus is always the the chief shepherd of the church. So he has the authority to speak into the life of every church. And he has the perspective to speak in to the life of every church. Why? Because he sees everything. Jesus sees the hearts. He searches the hearts and the motives. And so unlike all of us here, we can look and we can kind of speculate what's going on and we can kind of evaluate, but it's always a flawed perspective because we don't see like Jesus sees. But Jesus, when he evaluates When he speaks into our lives, he speaks perfectly. And he speaks that which is absolutely true because he sees everything, even our, the motives of our heart. And, uh, you know, oftentimes our our perspective is so, is so flawed. So I, 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 my time here wouldn't be complete unless I told you guys a hunting story, right? Sorry, sorry. I do it in Colorado too. So my, my hunting is taking on a new adventure in Colorado. Uh, I call it bow hiking because I take my bow and I just go on long hikes and that seems to be all that ever happens. But nonetheless, I'm hunting and it's fun. And so a uh, totally different kind of hunting. I'm way, way in the back country. And uh, this past year I had hunted a couple days and I was moving spots. So I was in my suburban and I'm way back on these like forest service roads like 30 miles from a blacked up road out in the middle of nowhere. And I'm, I'm driving along and I'm looking, I'm just kind of scouting for areas and seeing if it's, it's about an hour from sundown. So I'm looking for elk that might be coming out and I'm approaching a turn and I see a pond down below me. It's a pretty steep hill and I see a pond and I'm like, I want to get a better look at that. See if there's any, you know, any critters out there at the pond. So I go around a turn, there's a bunch of trees here and I'm pulling up to where that pond is and I go ahead and roll my window down so I can see more clearly and I'm edging up and I'm even craning my neck like this to look down so I can see if there's anything at this pond. And as I'm really focused intently looking, I catch movement much closer to me, like about 15 yards from my Suburban. I catch movement and my eyes refocus on that and there's a guy there and he's in full camo and he's got his bow and he's got an arrow knocked on it and he's stalking and he's going. (laughs) And I was like, oh, I, I moved on and as I'm driving away, I'm thinking, that ain't the way it looks, buddy. I promise you. Okay, so there's, there's two lessons there. The first one is that oftentimes we can't see what is clearly in front of us because we're so focused on something else, right? Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus has the ability to focus on all things at all times. He knows exactly what, he's, Jesus is never like, oh, I, I didn't see that. I didn't realize that. Oh, now I understand. But that's the way we are because we, can, we can't focus on everything at once. But really the bigger takeaway is as I was driving away, I'm like, that guy is 100% convinced uh, that I was doing one thing, being nosy, wondering, what's he looking at? What's he stalking? And, he, and, and what, what, what is, what, what, where is it? If this guy, I guarantee you, he tells the story. Hey, I was out hunting this idiot with Oklahoma plates. Actually, I had my Colorado plates. Pulls up, and I'm clearly stalking, and he pulls up to see if he can see what I'm stalking. What an idiot. You, I could not convince that guy of anything else, could I not? I, like he would be fully convinced. But seriously, that, I, I didn't even see him. He would say, how could you not see me? So here's my point. Things, sometimes we're so convinced that things are a certain way and they're not. Our, our perspective is flawed. 
We don't know all the details. We don't know people's hearts. We don't know what's going on. And so we have to trust that Jesus is taking care of his church. And he will speak into the life. And he'll, he'll deal with things. And I just want to say one thing. And then I'm not going to be, uh, uh, I'm going to move on and we'll teach the rest of the passage. But here's, here's what I know about the leaders of this church. I pastored here for 14 years. And these elders that are currently elders, that have been elders, and they, they served, I served with them. And I can tell you that their, their motive for all those years, and I even knew them before that, I knew them when this church started, uh, has, has always been to find out what does Jesus think and what would Jesus do. And that's the agenda. And there's never been another agenda. And you might think that there's some other agenda or some other thing going on, and I certainly don't know all the details, and neither do you, and, and, but Jesus does. And so he, he has the authority and the perspective to speak in. Now, if he could write a letter, Dear New Community Church, you know, um, he, he's, he hasn't done that, but what we have is his word, and so we open up his word and we say, Lord, we, we make your timeless truth relevant to our current situation. Help us to know what we're to do in light of this. And then God also prompts and his spirit leads those who he has placed as under shepherds. That's how Jesus leads the church now is to under shepherds who seek to discern his will. So the church belongs to, to Jesus though. New Community Church is not Chuck Angel's church. It's not Tim Salter's church. It's not Matthew Costner's church. It is not the elder's church. It is Jesus' church. And so there's a, like a sense of confidence that we can have knowing that we're all jacked up. We're flawed. We're going to make mistakes. We don't know, you know, always what's going on, but he does. And so we're constantly looking to him. Please give us your perspective. You speak to us about this situation. All right, so uh, the church belongs to Jesus and his words to us are really the ones that matter. That's the perspective we're after. Number two is that Jesus, that because he sees everything, he sees and affirms all the good that we're doing. Look at what he affirms this church for. Uh, I know your deeds, your love, and your faith, your service, and your perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. This church has a lot of great things going for it. A lot of things that, for instance, like, like Ephesus, they had left their first love. Well, that was not the case with Thyatira. They were a loving church. They were a serving church. I mean, they were seeking to connect the disconnected and grow together towards full maturity in Christ, and they were persevering in that. I mean, they, they were really getting after it. And, and Jesus sees that, and he affirms it. And, and notice that it says that they were doing more than they did at first. They were growing this was a growing, seemingly thriving church that had a lot of good things going for it. And that's the awesome thing about Jesus is he doesn't just hammer us, but he says, look, this is awesome. This is good. And he affirms us on those things. And pretty much with all of us, there's going to be a mix of things that we're doing good and things that we need to work on. And so Jesus is kind and he's gracious and he affirms us. And, uh, and, and um, that's something that we can... Can, can listen to and find um, encouragement in. But there's a but. <laughs> and it quickly, quickly we move because Jesus moves quickly. He says, look, I see all that you're doing, uh, but regardless of how much good we do, it never excuses our sin. That's number three. Regardless of how much good we do, it never excuses our sin. So he says, nevertheless, I have this against you. So I know your deeds, I know your love, your service, your perseverance. You guys got a lot of great things going on. Nevertheless, I have some things against you. And this is the pattern in these, you know, in these letters, all right? So you guys have been introduced to this. Um, but, but before we move through it, there's, there's uh, and, and hopefully you've taken note of this as you've, as you've gone through these things, and that is sometimes we think because of all the good that we're doing that it somehow excuses or justifies areas of sin in our life. And we're like, look, yeah, I got this going on, but look how much good I'm doing here. And, and so we can kind of talk ourselves into thinking that we don't need to deal with the sin because there's all this good that's happening. And God should, you know, kind of be thankful that I'm not doing work for him because look how much is happening. That's what was going on with this church. I'm sure the church at Thyatira uh, did not deal 
with their sin, with the sin issues that was going on because they thought, look, look how much good is happening. I mean, we're reaching people and they may have even thought, you know what, probably the reason why we're reaching a lot of people is because we're not like this legalistic body. There's a little bit of freedom here. You know, like, like, like you know, you don't have to be like straight laced. Like we got people, we're reaching people that are worshiping all these different gods and, and, and they're used to going to parties you know, worshiping these gods, and there's some, there's some kind of crazy, you know, college fraternity sex stuff going on, and that's just, that's just, hey, I'm glad we're reaching them, and, and, you know, we're loving one another, and we're serving the community, and so I think that they probably made the mistake of excusing their sin, and not dealing with it, and not taking it seriously, because they had a lot, (coughs) because they had a lot going on, and you and I, as individuals can fall into this trap in a hurry. We can deceive ourselves into thinking that like it's this scale, but that's not, God is not just concerned about what we do for him. He's concerned about our, our holiness. He's concerned about our, the Bible calls it sanctification. That's the process of, of, of us, our salvation working its way out in us. The Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So this is a process of us becoming more like Jesus. Jesus isn't just interested what individuals can do for him. He's interested in us. He wants us to be transformed in the likeness of his son. And then when he deals with churches, he's not just interested in what churches will do for him. He wants us to represent him as a pure bride. That's the imagery that's used in the Bible. We're the bride of Christ and he wants us pure. So Jesus always cares about sin. He's, he's always going to go, yeah, this is good. but, And he doesn't do it with a hammer. He does it with grace. But there is warning to it. And he does have blazing eyes and feet of bronze. And he's, there's, 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 there's judgment that's coming, but there's an offer, an extension of, of forgiveness first. And so that's, that's where we get to in the later points. But regardless of how much good we do, it, it just never excuses our sin, which leads us to number four, and that is that the enemy's primary tactic to bring us down remains unchanged, idolatry and sexual immorality. It's kind of like what Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. It almost always boils down to idolatry and to sexual immorality. Now that looks different, somewhat different in different time periods, But then again, at its core, it is the same. So he says this in verse 20, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Man, he is naming names. Except the name that he names here probably isn't a specific woman's real name. He's referring to a a Jezebel, if you know your Old Testament, First Kings, the story of Elijah, and the, the, when he has this battle on Mount Carmel, well, th- there was a king named Ahab, and he had a wife named Jezebel, and they were wicked. They were the most wicked king and queen that had ruled Israel in, in a long time, and they led the nation of Israel to worship false demon gods. And they would sacrifice to these demon gods. And it was so corrupt. And, it, and along with their worship of these Baals that they would seek to worship so the Baals would bless their crops. It was all tied into the crops and, and them get, being provided for. There was always sexual immorality. The, the temple would have these, these uh, uh, women there who were temple prostitutes. So a part of worship to these demon gods was, was, was sexual and it was just so corrupt. And so this is a reference back to that. Jesus says, you've got this kind of thing going on and you tolerate it. You tolerate it. So what, what was kind of happening in Pergamum? Remember the, the, they, they held to the teachings of the Nicolaitans? It's the same, the same old corrupt idolatry and immorality, but it's full blown in Thyatira. What was kind of, you know, brewing in and happening uh, with a few people apparently in, in uh, Pergamum is now being taught in Thyatira. So he says, you tolerate this woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. So she's like this spiritual leader. And her teaching, uh, by her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality to the eating of food sacrificed to idols. 
So we'll define those terms here in a second, but there's a statement there in your notes that I think is worth us just uh, touching on, and that is that in an age when tolerance is demanded, we live in the age of tolerance, right? The church must remain intolerant of false teaching and unabashed sinful behavior within its own ranks. Now that is carefully worded and I used uh, an awesome word and I looked it up in the dictionary to make sure it meant exactly what I thought it meant and that is unabashed. It's like out front, we're proud of our sin, kind of just like unembarrassed, unrepentant, anything, it's just out there. And notice this, so Jesus is saying, you tolerate this woman. You tolerate her teaching in your church. And she's leading believers, my servants, she's leading them away from me. And you're tolerating it. So the church is to never tolerate teaching or behavior within its own ranks. Now, we don't judge the world, right? God will judge the world. We don't judge it. We can't, we can't expect the world to live by biblical godly standards when they don't believe in the God of the Bible and they haven't received Jesus. And so the world's going to be the world. This is the church that Jesus is talking to. You know, the scripture says judgment begins with the house of God. So if you, if you claim to be a follower of Christ, then, and, and I claim to receive him as Savior and Lord, it means he's Lord, and that means what he says goes, and anything that we teach or do beyond that we're called to repent. And so Jesus says, you're, you're, toler- you're letting this woman like, teach this. Like, this is okay. So what was she teaching? Well, she was, she was teaching, first of all, uh, it says that, that it was okay to eat food that had been offered to idols. What's up with that? Well, it's just a reference to these pagan worship ceremonies. Um, and so in Thyatira, Thyatira was known, I mentioned, they were a blue-collar town. They were known for all their trades. If you're in the book of Acts, one of the first uh, women that Paul leads to the Lord is a woman called Lydia. And we learn that Lydia is a dealer in purple cloth. And guess where she's from? She's from Thyatira. So they were known for their textile industry, their bronze industry. And so with each of these trades, they had these trade guilds. Pretty much all of the commentators and scholars uh, from other extra biblical uh, sources have determined that this was a big deal there. So they had these trade guilds. So whatever trade you were part of, you would belong to a guild, sort of like a brotherhood in that particular trade. And each trade guild had a patron god. And so a part of their kind of gatherings as a fraternity of tradesmen would be this homage or this worship to a particular God. Could have been Apollos, could have been some other Greek God. But they would gather and and they would engage in offering sacrifices and then they would eat that meat. So the eating of this meat was very much a part of, 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 a, of a pagan worship ceremony. And then there would have been sexual immorality very much a part of that. Kind of like a, just a big like frat party, uh, gone wild, just kind of all this you know, the worst kind of sexual immorality, okay? So, so that's, what, that's what she was teaching. This is okay. Now, before we go, oh, yeah, well, we don't deal with that, right? We're not having pagan parties and offering up chickens and, and so forth. But what we learn in the New Testament is that idolatry doesn't just have to look like that, right? Idolatry is, let's define it, it is love for anything or anyone above God. We can make an idol out of anything, out of our work, out of our success, out of our recreation. I can make an idol out of my kids. I can make an idol out of anything. It's when that becomes the thing in my life that I love more than anything else. And it's also looking to anyone or anything else as the source for what I need. And that was really what was going on with these trade guilds because if you stopped being involved with the trade guilds and the parties and the festivals and the sex and all of that, it was kind of like, I'm not going to be a part of this business. You would have been sort of ostracized. So what the people would have felt like is, listen, for me to make a living, for me to have, be able to provide for my family and to be able to do my trade, I've got to be involved in this. And what this Jezebel woman was teaching was, that's okay. Look, it's Jesus knows that you need to provide for your family. He knows that. He's merciful. And so 
we, we're, we're free. There's freedom in Christ. It probably was along these lines, you know? And so you know that your heart belongs to Jesus and so that you know that you're not really, you don't really believe that stuff. But So you can do that and really be a part of it and it's not that big a deal. And when it comes to the sex, look, you know, Jesus has redeemed your spirit and this is just an old fleshly body and it doesn't really matter. The only problem was the Bible says over and over and over and over and over again, God deeply cares about idolatry and about sexual immorality. He cares what's first in our life and he cares how we behave sexually over and over and over again. And those two are often very much linked. And so the idolatry was, listen, you're, ch you're chasing after, you're giving your love, you're pursuing these other gods, and you're looking to them ultimately as a source. And Jesus says you're, you're tolerating this teaching and this behavior. And then the sexual immorality, the word is just pornea. It's where we get pornography. It's kind of an umbrella word that meant it could be fornication, just like single sex outside of, you know, marriage, sleeping around. It could have been adultery, that is, sex outside of the covenant of marriage. You're married, but you're sleeping with somebody else. Would have included that. Would have included homosexuality, same sex. So it, would have been, it was an umbrella term, and it says this is, what's, this is what's going on. You're tolerating it. This is sin, and over and over and again in the Bible, it'll say things like flee sexual immorality. And, it, and these two are connected. Colossians 3 says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to the sinful nature. And listen to the list. It's not on the screen. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. So there's like this, there's like this connection between when we give our heart to something, when we pursue it, it, it often ends up leading to sexually immoral behavior. And we see it over and over and over again. So uh, this past Wednesday, we got to... Um, we got to participate, enjoy uh, our first genuine Colorado blizzard. We had a full-blown blizzard. And you may have, if you're like a Weather Channel uh, geek and you like watching all the weather, all, uh, you, you may have heard this term, but it's the first time I've ever heard of it. They called it a bomb cyclone. They said, we're having a bomb cyclone. I'm like, what? what is a bomb cyclone? So I Googled it, and sure enough, it's a meteorological term. And it refers to, another word that they use is bombogenesis. That's a fun word to say to your neighbor. Go ahead, say it to him now. Say, bombogenesis. Just, I want to make sure that you guys are tracking with me. Okay, good. All right, so there was a bombogenesis, there was a bomb cyclone, and it's when the, uh, the, the, the pressure drops 24 millibars, it's a measurement of pressure. It drops 24 millibars within 24 hours. And what it means is this is a rapidly, you know, the, 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 the storm is developing rapidly. So winds come out of nowhere. And so basically what it was is it was a, a hurricane strength winds, category two hurricane, but it's snow and a blizzard. When you're sitting by your fire and you're at home drinking good coffee, it's awesome. If you're on I-70, not so good. They had to close it. But uh, so it just, man, it just, bam, out of nowhere. But it's really not out of nowhere. It's been building. You know how weather does. I mean, it pre pre you know, there are weather systems moving, and that's why they're able to predict it because they know there's patterns, and they know that how, how, how the low-pressure systems work with high-pressure, moist air, dry air. They know all that, so they can say in advance, this is developing, this is coming, and when it comes, man, it's, the bottom's going to drop out. There's a bomb cyclone that goes off in a person's life when they, when they allow idolatry, and sexual immorality. And it doesn't happen immediately, but it begins to build, and it begins to build. And Jesus is saying, the bomb is gonna drop on you guys. And there's a, there's a, there's a, there's the, the reaping is in the sin itself, and then Jesus goes on and he says, listen, I'm going to judge this. You, you can't live like this. And this isn't out of, you know, stinginess by God. This is because he loves us and he knows that sin destroys us. God knows that idolatry destroys us and he says, so, he's, so he won't tolerate it. And so that leads us to number five. And this is the good news of the gospel built into this letter to the church. God is patient. 
and he extends his grace to those who will repent, but suffering to those who refuse. It may sound old school, but this is like what the Bible teaches. Repent or else. And a lot of times we want to soft sell this, but let's just read Jesus' words. I have given her time to repent. So there's the grace. He's given her time. I, we don't know how that message was given. Maybe John had spoken with her. Maybe, maybe Jesus had, had spoken through some of the other leaders. Uh, I doubt it because they seem to be tolerating. In some way, God said, I have given her time, and she has not repented of her immorality. Uh, she's unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. It's kind of like Jesus says, oh, she wants, she wants a bed? She wants to sleep around? I'll put her on a bed. I'll put her on a bed of suffering. That's the, that's the tone here. I'll put her on a bed of suffering. And I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. Again, grace is extended. Just repent. Just change your mind. Change your actions. Turn away from that. Turn to God. If you'll repent, there's grace. There's forgiveness. There's wholeness. But we have to repent or we're going to suffer Verse 23, I will strike her children dead. It's probably a reference to those of her followers. And then all the church will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each one of you according to your deeds. Wait a second. I thought we were, I thought we were judged based on our faith. Here it says, I'm, ba I'm judging you based on your deeds. The answer is yes, because faith equals works. Works doesn't equal faith. But real faith produces real works, right? That's what the book of James teaches us, uh, that, that, that you, some say, I have faith, but I have works. He goes, show me your faith without works. I'll show you my faith by what I do. Faith does things. Faith has a, a, a fruit to it. And so, but so, so Jesus just cuts to the chase. He says, listen, if you're living like this, I'm going to judge you for what you're doing. But you can repent. And my grace is extended to you which leads us to number five, which is such incredible news that God's grace extends beyond forgiveness, promising unimaginable rewards. So just like God promises suffering, he also promises rewards. If we'll just repent. And so, so there's warnings. And, and by the way, these warnings are all through the scripture. So his grace is extended, and it says in verse 24, now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, so not everybody was guilty of this. There was a faithful remnant. And he says, to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. So he's like, listen, you're doing a good job. You just keep holding on. You just stay faithful until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will till the end, I will give authority over nations. So, so Jesus says, in, if, you, if you're faithful to the end, he doesn't say, hey, to those of you who prayed to receive Jesus and were baptized, bingo, you're, you're going to be victorious. The book of Revelation uses this verbiage all the time. Those who are faithful to the end. It's not to cause us to wring our hands and to say, have I done enough? Am I going to be okay? But it's to say, I am called over and over again to walk out faithfulness in my life and be faithful all the way to the end. So to the one who's victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over nations. What is that about? How many of you here want authority over nations? You're like, yes, I have ambitions to have authority over over the nations. This has been what I've been working for all my life. I will rule! It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of like a weird incentive, right? To him who's victorious, what about the mansion deal? Like, I, let's talk about that. No, Jesus talks about you're gonna rule over nations. And then he quotes, he, he, he says, he quotes Psalm. He says, that one will rule them uh, with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. So here's in Psalm 2, flash it up on the screen real quick. Verse 9, you will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. What's it talking about? It's talking about when Jesus comes again, his second coming, and he sets up what the Bible calls the millennial kingdom, his literal rule and reign on planet Earth. 
That's not fiction. That's not a Tim LaHaye book. That's actually from our Bible that there's going to be a, it, that Jesus, it's a fulfillment of many, 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 many scriptures. One of them we talk about at Christmas where it says the government will be on his shoulders and he will be ever, everlasting father, prince of peace, mighty God. You know, that's Jesus ruling planet earth in fulfillment of all these scriptures. And it says that the faithful, his faithful ones are going to rule with him. So later in the book of Revelation, he says, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. And they had not worshiped the beast or its image and not have, had not received the mark on their foreheads. And they came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. They reigned with Christ. It's not just those who lose their heads for the sake of the gospel that reign with Christ. That promises through the the excuse me, the Old and New Testament. So here's the deal. Those who are faithful, Jesus writes this church. He says, you can't be tolerating idolatry and immorality. You got to get that out of your life and you need to repent and then you need to live faithfully. And if you'll live faithfully till the end, there's something coming that is going to blow your mind. Planet Earth is going to be unlike it's never been before and you're going to be leaders. You're going to, you're going to rule and reign. There's probably going to be a rebuilding of planet Earth after seven years of tribulation that just that levels mountains and cities. And, and I, I can't imagine. Sometimes I just let my mind go, and I try to imagine what that will be like living in a glorified body that doesn't get sick and that doesn't have disease. And there's, there's not, I'm not dealing with those, and, and I'm able to serve Jesus without the old body of sin. And there's a sense of adventure. There's a sense of excitement. There's a sense of, I'm going to be a part of something that I've always wanted to be a part of. Listen, the church is supposed to be a little bit of a picture of God's kingdom coming, right? But we're still so flawed, and our experiences end up being flawed. And we're like, what is this? You know what this is? This is living in a sinful world. And you know when it's going to change ultimately forever? It's when Jesus returns. And then we're going to serve him together. And there's going to be just these experiences that are going to, we're just going to say, this is, this is freaking awesome. It's awesome that we get to be a part of his kingdom. This is what the disciples wanted. Remember, they're like, hey, can we sit at your right hand and at your left in your kingdom? And he's like, that's not for me to decide. Plus, they didn't understand that that was going to come later. Jesus' kingdom isn't of this world. But it's going to come at his second coming. And so the call is be faithful to the very end and there's, you're gonna get to rule and reign and have responsibilities. He who's faithful with a little will be given responsibility over much. The direct application of that is in the millennial kingdom, you will be given responsibilities based on your level of faithfulness right now. That's to all of us. And then the other reward is that we will experience being with Christ at a whole new depth. He says, I will give that one the morning star. What is the morning star? Well, Jesus identifies the morning star as himself. Later in the book of Revelation, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the bright and morning star. I was the one the prophet spoke of, and I'm the bright and morning star, and you get to have me. You're like, I have Jesus now. You do if you're a believer. But we will have him at a whole new depth and a whole new level in the kingdom and in heaven to come. And so the call right now in this messy, in this messy world is to be faithful. Faithful to him, faithful to his words. I want you to bow your heads. The last verse in this passage is he who has ears, let him hear. Whoever has ears, let him hear. That means not everybody's gonna hear because not all of us have ears. Some of you maybe are here and you would consider yourself a believer, but you have obvious areas, if you're honest with yourself, of idolatry and immorality in your life. And you've heard a message that Jesus doesn't tolerate that and he doesn't want you to tolerate it in your own life. He wants us to repent. And so now is just a moment where we can just repent. And man, I tell you what, I, every one of us, every one of us at some level, at some level, 
can say, Jesus, this is idolatry. Jesus, this is flirting with immorality. I don't, I don't want anything to do with that. Forgive me. I repent of it. I turn from it. I turn to you. And Jesus, I desire to experience your grace in this moment. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to cleanse me. Some of you, maybe you're repenting for the very first time. And Jesus' arms are welcoming you wide open if you will repent and turn to him in faith. Thank you to Jesus for the promises for the kingdom to come and all that you have in store for us. May we be faithful to the end and may we have ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen.